on down. All right, you guys can come this way, fill this circular region in. <clears throat> All right, so question for you guys this morning. Are you awake and are you excited to be here today? Yeah? yeah? Not, really Not really awake, but still excited, right? Right on. So I want to ask you a question, another question. <clears throat> Excuse me. So how many of you guys have dogs? Okay. What kind of dogs do you have? You have a what? You have a massive dog, don't you? Yeah, it's like a, it's like a horse. Mastiff or something like that. I'm not even sure. Uh, okay. Huge. Whatever it is. Big. What you got? Two boxers, okay, that's that's awesome, and a Shih Tzu. Okay, what about you guys? A border collie. A border collie. I'm not sure what that is, but that sounds cool. I know, is that like Lassie? Lassie, mom and dad? Okay, right on. All right, what do you got, Hunter? I have, a, I have two dogs, but I don't know what type they are. Sweet. Okay, right on. Okay, what about you guys? I have a small dog. Okay, a small dog. That's, that's the best kind, by the way. Um, what about you? A cocker spaniel. <clears throat> All right, so I want to tell you a story. Can I tell you a story? The, uh, the Maxwell family is not big into dogs and animals, if you didn't know that. Um, that's unfortunate. We'll probably get some shame looks at us later today, and I'm okay with that. Um, but we're not big animal people. Like, I never was growing up. Holly's parents raised rat terriers, so she got burned pretty bad with that. Um, you know, so, so <laughs> not the biggest dog family. But my grandparents have a dog. What's Pop Pop's dog's name? Cody. Cody. Okay. So every time we go over to my grandparents' house, they, uh, they call Grandpa Pop Pop. Every time we go to my grandparents' house, uh, Cody is this Cocker Spaniel, okay, that is like s small Cocker Spaniel, I think, but just so ridiculously rowdy and like jumps all over the place. The kids panic every time we walk in the door. Um, because they're not sure if like they're gonna get bitten or scratched or knocked down or pummeled or something like that. And so this past week, Salem, have a seat, honey. Say, 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 sit down. Okay, sit down. So this past week, we go to my grandparents' house, and as we are uh, walking in the house, Salem begins to to cry and and fuss because this dog is like all over the place, a little bit more than usual. Like, all over the place. So what do you think she thought was going to happen to her? She thought that she was going to get attacked. And so I had to hold her. I had to, like, um, like, hold on her and make sure that she knew that she was safe and protected. But she still kept crying. Remember when you cried when Cody came the other day, when we saw Cody? You cried and cried and cried and cried and cried. Now, even though I was holding her, she was still crying. Now, do you think that I would have ever let anything happen to her? Do you think that I would have let that dog jump on Salem? No. no, I wouldn't have let that. Do you think that I would have let that dog bite Salem? No. no. Okay. But she still cried. She still fussed, even though I was holding her. So she forgot for a second that I was her dad and that I was going to take care of her. Right? And, and don't you know that sometimes, like, when you, when you get older, you'll, you'll, um, you'll, you'll begin to understand what it means to to trust Christ as your Savior, when you, when you get saved and you have a relationship with God, um, there'll be times, uh, even though you may be a child of God, where you forget that God is your Father. And sometimes when you forget that God is your Father, it makes you, it makes you afraid. It makes it feel as if you are going to be attacked. It makes it feel as if you are all by yourself, when in reality you are, you are really just a child of God, and God is going to protect you and keep you safe and watch over you and make sure that nothing happens to you that he's not going to help you with, right? So as you get older, as you accept Christ as your Savior, as you uh, have a relationship with God in the future, never forget that as a child of God, you're going to be protected and secure and blessed just because you are a child of God, okay? Uh, I want to pray with you guys, but I want to give you some gummies before, actually we'll pray first and then I'll give you some gummies. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, giving us a good morning and thank you for the chance to worship today. Um, Lord, thank you for these uh, children that are a blessing. I pray that you would help them to never forget, uh, Lord, that as they um, begin to uh, understand what it is to have faith in you, uh, that you'll help them to remember that uh, as children of God, uh, Lord, that they are protected and secure and safe. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>
got your Bibles this morning, grab your Bibles and stand underneath them today. Right on. Look at that. Pretty sight. Pretty sight. All right, you can have a seat this morning. You can have a seat. Open up to Romans chapter 8 this morning. And as you turn there, I want to I begin just by uh, having some conversation with you. Um, you know, we live in life where, where there's a lot of struggle, there's a lot of pain, uh, there's a lot of loss, uh, oftentimes loss that we can't prevent. Uh, there's a lot of hardship and difficulty, uh, things that you probably never would have thought that you would have dealt with at any point in your life. Um, when you were 20-some, 30-some, you never thought that you would encounter the things that you've encountered. Now you look back when you're 50, 55, and you think, man, I, I never expected to deal with the difficulty and hardship that, that has come uh, in my, my path over these handful of years. Um, you deal with a lot of, a lot of things that, that you never expect to deal with. And, and a lot of times when you're in the face of difficulty and, and hardship and the face of things that don't seem right and don't seem fair, a lot of times like our, our natural and initial response is to sort of respond with fear, to respond with, with anxiety, uh, with, with confusion, with, with worry, when things are uncertain, when things don't seem to be the way that we think that they should be. That's the way that, that we respond. Maybe, maybe that's not you, but that's, that's me. Maybe, maybe that's all of us. When there's places where things are chaotic and we don't really know exactly how, how to respond. But one of the greatest blessings and one of the greatest privileges that we have, and this is for those that have placed their faith in Christ, that know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they are genuinely children of God, is to know that we are the children of God. To know that we are the sons and the daughters of God. And, and that's something that, that, that doesn't change. That's something that is unconditional as a believer, like you are a child of the God that created this world. And that is an awesome privilege and benefit that I think that we, we really don't understand the depth of what that looks like. And so we, we understand that hardship is going to come. We understand that difficulty is going to happen. But when we, when we face those things, we shouldn't have to lose our joy. We shouldn't have to lose gladness of heart. We shouldn't have to lose our our confidence in God, but oftentimes we do because we forget that we are children of God and, and, and we act just like, just like my daughter and just like your kids have acted before. When they've faced fear, when they've faced circumstances that would have been fearful to them, they respond by forgetting that they were the son or the daughter of you. And you're thinking, like, why, <clears throat> why is my child not, not stopping crying right now? Why are they still afraid? Why are they still scared? Don't they know that I'm going to protect them and care for them? <clears throat> Excuse me. That's the way that we are with with God. Even though we are children of God, we oftentimes forget that we are that we are His children. That we will be taken care of. But one of the greatest assets that we can have in this life is to know that we are held tight and held secure by a God that created us, and we are His His children. So as you look at Romans uh, eight to today, uh, verses twelve through seventeen, that's where we're we're going to be. That's where we're going to be looking at in our text. But you can't. You can't just jump in mid-chapter in Romans chapter 8. You have to, to look back to see where it sort of comes from, where the conversation begins. And, and I think you have to look back to, to Romans chapter, chapter 7. So we're going to look today at four different things that Paul says about uh, what it means to be a son and a daughter of God. But before we do that, we have to lay some groundwork. And, and Romans is a book that's, that's incredibly deep. It's incredibly rich with, uh, with theology. And a lot of times when you look at a book like Romans, you, you tend to be a little bit hesitant to, to look at it and study it because there's so much that's there. I had a conversation with, uh, with a guy this week that was saying that, that this particular passage, this, this passage is like one big run-on sentence. And how do, you, how do you understand what Paul is talking about? And I think a lot of times we, we push away and that we're a little bit um, fearful because we don't really know how to understand all that what, what Paul is trying to say. But when you look at a book like, like this, you look at what this says to us, it tells us so much about who God really is. It's a book that's got so much theology, which is the study of God. And so when you look at a book like this that tells us so much about who God is, it then sort of shows us how that we should live. Because our lives are to be lived in response to who God is. Our lives are not to be lived in response to who we are, but in response to who God is. 
And so how are you going to be able to live your life effectively and properly if you first don't know anything about the God that you're trying to love and serve? And so you look at Romans and you see so much of, what, of what's there. And you see that, that ultimately, like, you understand more about God by studying this book and by, by understanding more about God, you understand, like, the need for, for missions and reaching out to, to other people. You understand uh, how that your service should be conducted within the household of God. By understanding more about God, you understand how that you're a better parent, how that you're to be a better husband, how that you're to be a better wife, how that you're to be a better worker in your job, even if it's a secular job outside of ministry. So your understanding of God is so important to every single thing that you will encounter in life. So you have to have a solid foundation for God, of God, before being able to live effectively. Because this life is not about us, but this life is about is about Him. We get to be an awesome asset to the to the story that He's made. We get to be a part of the work that He's doing. But it's not about us. It's about it's about Him. And so in Romans chapter seven, which I think is where sort of this conversation begins, um, you see this conversation take place of that Paul sort of lays out with the believer's responsibility with, with the law. You look at uh, chapter 7 and verse 4, and this is what he says. He says, Wherefore, my brethren, uh, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye who should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. And then you look at verse 6, and here's what he's saying. But now uh, we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that uh, we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of, of the letter. So you look at these verses here and you see that, that as believers of placing your faith in Christ, you've been free from the restraint of the law of God. We look at the law of God and we see all these things that, 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 that are required of us, the things that we should do, the things that we should not do. And when it comes down to it, there's no way that you or I, with anything that is within us naturally, have the ability to uphold the standards that God has laid forth in the Word of God. I mean, if we were to try to live according to the Word of God, and if we could even uh, attempt to get there in perfection, like there would have never been a need for Christ to come. But Christ came, He fulfilled the law perfectly, and therefore if we place our faith in Christ, He gives us the righteousness that he earned by living in this life, right? That's, that's what it means to be in Christ. And so he says in here in verses 4 and 6 that we're dead to that, that that doesn't have any restraint over us anymore, but we are in Christ. That is a beautiful thing, which means that we have freedom, that we have freedom. We don't have to try to measure up to the standard because Christ has become our standard for us. So this is what we see that provides freedom for us. Then you go into verses 7 through 9, and he says this. He says, What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? God forbid, let it never be. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. He says, I would have never been able to know about my sin unless it was for the word of God that showed me that I was sinful. In verse 9, he says, For I was alive uh, without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. So he says that based off the law of God, he looked at his life and saw his imperfections, which showed him that he needed a Savior. So it pointed him to Jesus. It pointed him to, to the cross. Like That's what the law of God is supposed to do. It points us to, to Jesus. That's why Paul says in Galatians that it's a tutor. It teaches us and points us. It guides us to Jesus because we can never keep it ourselves. We are limited people, but it should point us to the limitless, limitless one. And then you look at verses 15 through 21, and this is incredible with what Paul says. He says, For that which I do not allow, um, for what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it's no more that I do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, in my natural flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present within me. To do the good things are present, but how to perform that which is good, I don't find. I find not. For the good which I would, I do not do. The things that I want to do, I don't do. But the evil which I don't want to do, that I end up doing. In verse 20, Now if I do that what I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present within me. So he says that even in his attempt as a believer to live up to the standard um, that's been set forth in the law of God, by trying to do the things that he should do, he finds that he doesn't do those things. And the things that he doesn't want to do, he finds that he ends up doing these things. And we call this like the struggle of life, of being justified in Christ and having a relationship with Jesus here and now, but yet not fully being glorified face to face with Jesus. So we've got this area, this gap of struggle that we struggle with sin day in and day out. We desire to do right, but yet we can't find the will to do right. 
We desire not to do wrong, but we can't find the desire to avoid doing wrong, right? So it's, it's like this struggle that Paul is talking about. It's a real struggle of sin that we see present in our lives as a believer. And he goes on to say for, in verse 22, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And then in verse 24, he like exclaims, right? He says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Who's going to deliver me from this struggle? Who's going to deliver me from this, this difficulty of wanting to do good and not being able to do it? Who's going to deliver me from this? In verse 25, he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Who's going to deliver me? God's going to deliver me through Christ. He says, so then with my mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So even in this struggle of attempting to, to do right and doing wrong and trying to avoid doing wrong, but but not doing that completely, right? There's this struggle, and he says, who's going to deliver me? Who's going to rescue me from this? And he says, like, it's going to be God through Jesus Christ that rescues me from that. And that's the springboard going into chapter 8, verse 1. That leads us into probably one of the most famous verses that you can find in Romans 8 that says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. So who's going to deliver us from this body of death? Jesus is going to deliver us from this body of death. In the original Greek, there's no chapters, so it's just a continual conversation that's happening. And he says, now because of that, because of Christ delivering us, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. All right, so those of us who are believers, who are struggling with sin, even though we are wrestling against it day after day, there's, there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, even in the midst of struggling through sin. That's a beautiful, beautiful conversation that he says. There's no condemnation. And then he goes on, In verses 4 through 6, and he says, For the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And so in verses 4 through 8, he begins to talk about this us. Who is this us? Those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Those who are walking after the Spirit. Genuine believers. Verse 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, true believers, the things of the Spirit, the Spirit of God. For to be carnally minded is death. To have your mind on the flesh is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, uh, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither can, uh, can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So you see this two, two groups of people that are brought up. Those that are living in the flesh, and those that are living in the spirit. Those that are living in the flesh ultimately cannot please God. They don't have a relationship with God at all. But those that are living in the Spirit, those are those that are genuine believers, that have life, that live lives that are pleasing to God, that are fighting against sin, those that there is no condemnation against that are in Christ, in Christ Jesus. Then he goes into verse 9 through 11. I promise I'm getting somewhere with this. I promise I am. Verse 9. He says, but you are not in the flesh. Talking to these believers that he's writing to, in Romans, he says, but you're not in the flesh, this is not you, but you're in the spirit. You are believers, if so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Which means that you've accepted Jesus as your savior, that you are genuine believers, you've trusted Christ, you've got the spirit of God dwelling in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's, not, he's none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Verse 11, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, This spirit, the spirit of God dwelling in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So he's saying that as a believer, you've got the spirit of God that's dwelling in you. The same spirit that rose Christ from the dead is the spirit of God that is living within you. Same spirit that presents you as as being like no condemnation because you're in Christ. The same spirit that's walking after the spirit. Like this is the spirit that like the power that's living within you. There's no condemnation. This is you. And though he, then he goes into verses 12 through 17. And he begins to talk a little bit more about this spirit that lives within us that truly makes us sons and daughters of God. And so in verses 12 through 17, he lays out, based off of everything that he's just said, he lays out uh, benefits and privileges, four different benefits that we have because we are the sons of God, those that have the Spirit living in them, those that have placed their faith in Christ. So you can't just jump into verse 12 and say, therefore, brethren. Like, it's just sort of a, a, like a conversation that's already been continuous. You have to sort of back up and do what we did. So he continues in verse 12, and he lists off these four different benefits of being 
children of God. And the first thing that he says is in verses 12 through 14. And he says that our, our sonship in, in God leads us in holiness. Look at verse 12, 13, and 14. He says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if through the Spirit, um, if, but if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So therefore, continues us from verse 11, says that we have the ability through who we are in Christ to be led in, in holiness. You look at verse 12 and he says, you know, we are debtors. What does it mean to be in debt to someone? It means you owe them. You owe somebody something. So we as believers, we are in debt to, to something. We owe someone something. And he says that, you know, we're not in debt to the flesh to live after the flesh, which means that we are, we're not in debt to continue living in the flesh that we have here. We're not to be living for, for sinful desires. That's not, that's not who we are as believers. We are children of God, and therefore that's not the life that we're supposed to be living. We're not living to the flesh, but instead we're living to the Spirit. Look at verse 13. For if ye live after the flesh, you shall die. So those that are living after the flesh, those things that, that God specifically says do not do, the things that God commands, and yet you're not doing those things, constantly trying to please yourself above God, which is a way of saying that I'm more important than God. If that's the lifestyle that you're living, this is you that he's talking about, living after the flesh. And that leads to nothing but death. But he says that you as a believer, that's not the life that you're supposed to live. But instead, he, instead he says in verse 13, But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall, you shall live. And so it's the idea that instead of living for the flesh, you're living for the Spirit. And as you live with the Spirit of God within you, trying to obey the Spirit of God as He leads you to obey the Word of God, you find that you are putting to death the deeds of the flesh. Amen. And it means that you've got this desire that's within you as a child of God, right? a desire within you to put to death everything that's sinful within you. The lust that you have creep up in your mind. The greed that you have come up in your mind. The anger that you have come up in your mind out of nowhere. The impatience that you often are hit with when you're sitting in the middle of traffic and aren't really sure which way to go. When those things creep up within you, you've got a hatred for those things. Not just because you are put out of place, but because you know that's not the way that, that God has called you to live. Contrary to Scripture, right? And so it's, got, it's this idea that as you are living by the Spirit, the Spirit gives you this desire to put to death those things. That you're not just casually coming into church, but you are earnestly coming into church because you want to worship the God that created you. You want to walk in fellowship with Him. You don't want anything that's going to stand in your way in your relationship with God. You hate it. And so for us as believers, if we are walking after the Spirit, like that should be our desire that we're putting to death everything that hinders our relationship with God, that those moments of anxiety, those moments of, of fear, those things that cripple us at times, that we just despise those things, that we take them out back and beat them with a bat, right? That's what we should want to do with it, a desire to get rid of sin altogether. But what's so incredible is that if you look a little bit later in verse 14, he says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, which means that if you've got the desire within you to put to death that flesh... If you hate the sin that you see rising up within you, that's evidence of the fact that God is at work within you. It's evidence. Because apart from the Spirit of God being in you, there's no desire to be free from sin. What benefit is there if there's the Spirit of God's not within you? So the Spirit leads you. And even though it's a struggle, like Paul says in Romans chapter 7, it is a beautiful struggle. The fact that you are struggling over sin and, and trying to become more like Jesus, even though it's a nasty fight sometimes, it's a beautiful struggle because it shows evidence that God is still at work in your life, that God is not done. And the more that you find that you struggle with sin, the more that you find that grace is present in your life and it makes you love Jesus that much more, right? And so if you've got the desire, it's because the Spirit of God is within you, that's giving you that desire. So that's a beautiful thing to see. And Holly and I have had so many conversations about this. That a lot of times when we feel like God is about to do something big and about to do something good, it seems like there's so much spiritual opposition that happens. And it's because the enemy knows that something is brewing and something's taking place. 
And he wants to prohibit those things from happening. So if you're struggling, if you are in a place where you're struggling up, up against sin, it's because beautiful things are, are happening in the midst of that. Right? So the Spirit of God is at, is at work. It shows evidence that you are Son of God. So, so we see that our sonship leads us in holiness. And so if you don't have a desire to fight your sin, then I think the issue this morning is even before going even further to make sure that you are truly a child of God that you've truly placed your faith in Jesus and that you are living after the Spirit and not living in the flesh. It's evident. It's black and white. It's clear. If you have a desire to hate the sin, it's because of the Spirit that's within you. If it's not there, you need to consider where you are. So we have, you're led in our holiness because of the sonship that we have. The second thing that he brings to the table is in verse 15. And he shows us that our sonship gives us confidence. Our sonship gives us confidence. And I'm using the term sonship sort of like, you know, you're, even though you're a lady, you still are a part of his sonship too. Don't get offended, I promise. I'm talking about you. I'm not talking about just guys. Um, I heard a, a pastor say that, that, you know, just the other day, he was saying that, you know, we get to be called the sons of God, um, but, you know, the guys are referred to as the bride of Christ. So we'll make that an even exchange, right? Um, you get that. Okay. Um, so the second thing is in verse 15, and he says, that really our sonship gives us confidence. And this is what he says. He says, You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So he says two things. Amen. He says two things about this this verse. First thing is that we've not been given the spirit of slavery or bondage that leads leads to fear. Now, when you, when you look at bondage, when you look at slavery, it's the idea that you are completely controlled by something that is not you. You're, you're completely given over to something, a greater power than yourself. And so when he's saying that you have not received the spirit of slavery or bondage again to fear, it's sort of like referring back to where these believers once were. So he's writing to Jewish and Gentile believers. Know that context. And so he says that you've not received this Again, which means that at one point, this is where they were. They were living in this bondage that was leading them to to fear. And for many of these people, like if you look at the context and look at what they were up against, many of these people were living with the standard of the law that was set before them. And so as they were looking at the standard of the law that was set before them, these things they should do and should not do. And then they look at themselves and they say, like, how in the world am I ever going to meet that standard? Like, I know that I've got to meet that standard so that I can be accepted by God, right, based off of what, what, what he's talking about here. And it's like, how in the world can you stand before God knowing that you have fallen and failed in those places? So it created this sense of fear, not really knowing what was going to happen uh, for these people that were trying to earn their way to God. Based off of what they were trying to do to earn the favor, to earn the uh, appreciation of God, there was nothing that they could have done. And so it created this sense of fear in their lives that, that was sort of bondage, They didn't know what was going to happen to them after they they died. It led them into a place of being afraid. What was going to happen? And so Paul says, you have not received that that spirit. You've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be fearful of what's to come in the future when you you die. Why? Because you are in Christ. You are in the spirit. And Christ has become your, your righteousness, what we see in the gospel. So you don't have to be afraid, but instead of receiving the spirit of bondage again to fear, this is what they've received instead. But you have received the spirit of adoption. So instead of receiving the spirit of bondage that led to fear, they received the spirit of adoption. Adoption is the idea that you are brought into someone's family that you were once not a part of the family. It's a pretty simple concept. So if we look at being adopted into the family of God, which is what he's talking about in verse 15, it shows us that there's no universal, like, fatherhood of God. It's the idea that, that you, we are only children of God through this adoption process, which means that, like, only the children of God are those that have placed their faith in, in Christ, sort of what Mike touched on a little bit last week. And so those that have placed their faith in Christ, they are the adopted children of of God, and look at what this adoption sort of benefits us with. 
For you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption, which adoption in and of itself has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with the great and merciful God that would be willing to create the universe, spin things in orbit, be incredibly holy, yet choose to adopt nasty, sinful people into his family. That, that's beautiful in and of itself, right? But, but when you look at what that means even further is that we get to enjoy the, the benefits, the rights, the privileges of what God has and God owns every, everything. So therefore, we have everything based off of what we're going to read in just a few minutes. So we've been adopted into the family of God as, as believers. But then look at one of the greatest assets that we have as, as being adopted children. It says that we've not received the spirit of bondage that leads to fear, but in contrast to that, we've received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry. Abba, Father. We cry. What does it mean to cry? It means that you spontaneously like say things out loud, that out of your gut, not just these planned prayers that you have, but when things are hard and when things are uncertain, when things are chaotic, when things are out of your control, when you've gotten pushed to the end of your limits, when you have nowhere else to go but against the wall, you cry out from the bottom of your gut and you can cry out, Abba, Father. Now, the way that he says, Abba, Father, we've talked about this before, but, but ultimately it's, it's like a repetitious phrase that he uses. One, one word, Abba, is, is a Greek word. The word that he uses for father is a Syrian word. So he uses two different languages here, but he repeats himself. And I think it shows us a couple different things. I think it shows us, number one, that this term Abba is, a, is like a term of intimacy and endearment, which means that we have like a closeness and proximity with God that others do not get to enjoy. So even though God is, is magnificently huge that created the earth and spins things on his finger to keep things going, at the same time, he's so approachable, like that we get to be near the God that created everything. And then even in those moments where life is crazy, and maybe, maybe not externally, but just internally when things are crazy, like we get to have nearness and closeness with God. We get to be near, near Daddy. Just like when Salem jumped up in my lap with, with the dog this past week. We get to do that in moments where we have fear come over us. We're not, we're not protected from, from fearful things coming around us, but our response to that is that we should, just like a child, jump up into the arms and the lap of a daddy that will care for us. This is what we see with Abba Father. So we have that privilege. But the second thing that it means for us that he's using two different languages to say this is that, you know what, like this is for everybody. This is not just for the Jew. This is not just for the Gentile, but this is for all people, that all people get to enjoy what this looks like if they've placed their faith in Jesus. So we get to see that, that because, of, because of us being sons and daughters of God, that we, that we don't have to be afraid for, for what comes at us. So we go through the rest of this day, we go through tomorrow, we have no idea what this week is going to hold. We look at this past week that just passed, and we see a few different people that have dealt with, with death in the family. You know, at the beginning of the week, they had no idea. And by the end of the week, the funeral is done. That happens. Things come. You can't be guarded from those things. Things happen like that. But as a child of God, you can be confident that whatever comes your way, that God is in the midst of it all, that he's working all things as we see in 828, if you are a believer, for your good, for his glory. And that's something that we can be so incredibly confident in. So whatever the diagnosis, whatever the doctor says, we are children of God. We are never outside of his care. We're his children. In the same way that I would never let anything happen to my children, God is a, a, an infinity times better father than I am. With, than I am. And so we can know that he's going to protect and guard and shield us. We can live confidently that we are, that we are his then he goes in verse 16, and this sort of tags along with verse 15. He says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And this is the way of saying that in our flesh, we can't believe that this is even true. The Spirit of God has to witness and testify to us that this is actually true. We can't believe it by ourselves, but it takes the Spirit of God working within us to show us that we are truly His children. And then he goes even further, and he says, so he says in, in verse 12 through 14 that we are led in holiness by being a son of God. We can have confidence because we are son of God. But then he says in verse 17 that we can have a secure future because we are sons and daughters of God. Verse 17, he says, and if we are children, so tied to, to verse 16, so if we are children, we've placed our faith in Christ. If we're adopted, if we're living after the Spirit, then, then we're heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with, with Christ. So with, with this 
with this conversation, you've got a couple different things that are happening. He's talking about an inheritance. An inheritance is something that you, that you get that someone leaves you after they pass. It's something that you are brought into. It really has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with the family that you're in. So whether it's money, whether it's family, whether it's material things, whether it's land, whatever the case is, like those are things that you are brought into because you're a part of the family. So he's talking about this inheritance that we have, and he says two things about it. He says that we are heirs of God, and then he says that we are joint heirs with, with Christ. Now, this is, this is hard to understand because our minds can't grab it. But I want you to go back to Romans chapter 4, verse 13. So we look at this inheritance and we say, like, what in the world is this inheritance going to look like for us? Like, what, what does this mean? I'm going to have you go to, like, three different places, and I'll, I'll explain once we read these verses. Romans 4, 13, this is Paul talking to Abraham, and he says in verse 13, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world, the heir of the what? The world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith, which means that it comes to that line of Jesus. So it wasn't through obedience, but it came through faith. He was going to be an heir of the world. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians 3, verse 21, 22, and 23. It says, Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul, or Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours. And you're Christ, and Christ is God's. Or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours. And you're Christ." And Christ is God's, which means that we are God's. You know, Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, part of the Sermon on the Mount, the words of Jesus himself. That's what he says, 5, 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So you see these three verses. We'll go back to Romans chapter 8 now. You see these three verses and you see that, that in all these, he's talking, about, he's talking about inheritance. He's talking about what's to come. Something that's not quite now, but something that is to come. And he says that, that you, as believers, will inherit the earth, will inherit the world. And what, is, what does that look like for us? Like, how can the mind understand and grab a hold of the reality that as a child of God, what, what is God's in our inheritance will also be ours? That's something that the mind cannot even begin to comprehend. That in years to come, like what is God's will be, will be ours. And to know that, that even though we, we have struggled here on this earth, and even though we may be poor on this earth, in our future, in our inheritance, what is laid up for us, our riches untold, that we can't even begin to understand the half of that. And so what Paul is saying is that in your sonship, you've got, you've got a future that comes from, that comes from God that God created, that God initiated, that God is going to work out for you. But I think that even greater than, than the things that we'll be able to see that God will allow us to be a part of in the years to come, I think what will even be, will be greater is that if you look at Psalm 16, verse 5, you see something that's, that should be our desire. David is talking about having an inheritance in, in this as well. But this is what he says. He says, The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance, and of my cup thou maintainest my lot. So David's mind isn't on the world, it's not on the things that are to come, but it's on God himself. So one of the greatest benefits and assets of us being a son of God is knowing that we've got a future, but knowing that we've got a future with the God of the universe that created us. But we'll be able to not only believe Him by faith, but we'll be able to see Him by sight. Our faith will become sight as we stand before the God of everything. So our, our inheritance is, is God Himself. But then He says in Romans 8, verse 17, He says that, that we are joint heirs with Christ, which means that, that what is Christ will also be ours. We will be heirs along with, with Jesus, the Jesus that died on the cross for our, our sin to bring us into this relationship. So what does this mean for, for us? Is that in the midst of our chaos, in the midst of the struggle that we have, we have to remember that, that we are the sons of God. 
that we are the daughters of God. Colossians 2 tells us not to keep our minds focused on things that are happening here, but to keep our minds fixed on what's to come. And that's the idea, is that if you set your mind on things that are happening here and now, you will always, always, always find that it leads you into a pool of destruction, of depression, and discouragement. Things will go wrong. Things will let you down, so you can't put your hope in riches iPhones will continue to be brought out year after year after year. Things will always be different. You can't put your hope in one particular thing. So you set your eyes on what's to come. And so when you're going through the struggles and the chaos and the pain and whatever it is that's going on around you, fix your eyes on the future of what Christ has in store for you, knowing that even though the mind can't really grab it, we can believe it by faith to know that it's going to be true. So we are sons of God. It leads us in holiness. It leads us in confidence. It secures our future. But then you look at verse 17, the end of it. and We see that our sonship, it upholds us. It upholds us. The idea to uphold something is to keep it sustained. So verse 17 says, And if you're children, then you're heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him. Now this if is a, is a conditional phrase, but it's not tied to of us Um, you know, suffering as believers, but it's tied to the fact that if we are genuine believers, if we truly have placed our faith in Christ, then we will suffer in this life. Suffering that he's talking about is not just suffering as Christians, as believers, but if you look at uh, Romans 8, 23, just a few verses over, he says, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, which means that we have this inward churning within us, this inward groaning, waiting for the adoption, waiting for the perfection uh, to with the redemption of our bodies. And so it's this idea that while we're living on this earth, we're living in a world that's broken and tainted by sin in every single way. There's evil that happens. There's loss that takes place. There's wicked people in the world seeking to harm believers. There's tons of stuff that are happening that would be considered suffering that are falling into this. And he says that in the midst of, of suffering, that, that ultimately we may also be glorified together with him. So even though we may suffer, we've got something that's stronger. We are going to be upheld by by God. So in our sonship confirms those things taking place. Leads you into verse 18 through 39, which ultimately says at the end of this chapter that we have nothing that can separate us from the love of God, whether it's death or whatever it is, nothing separates us from, from this love. So this sonship is something that's beautiful for us. So if we understood, if we grabbed a hold of even just one ounce of what it meant to be a son or a daughter of God, our lives would be drastically different. We walk around putting to death like these things that are wicked in our lives, knowing that, that we are a child of God. Not only because we want to walk after the Lord, but man, we are a child of God. We can't like, make terrible use of this name. We are children of God. We'd also walk in confidence, not being afraid over over everything, walking around timid in life. We'd walk around with confidence knowing that as a child of God, God will always provide and always protect and always secure. You've seen it a thousand times in your life, and yet we still oftentimes doubt it. We would keep our eyes fixed on what's to come in the future. We wouldn't be so set on like the things here and now, which means that we wouldn't be so discouraged by what's happening here because our eyes would be on the future. And then in the midst of our suffering, we would find that we are upheld and strengthened by our Father, strengthened by God. So the application that I want to roll in today is, is pretty simple. Four different points of application, just real quick. First thing is don't live passive over your sin. Don't let sin take control of you. As a child of God, if you are in Christ, put to death the wickedness that's in your flesh continuously. And you say, well, I've done that. Keep doing it. Don't give up on it. At the worst of moments, it's going to pop its ugly head up. It's what happens. So continually slay that. Secondly, stand confidently as a son or a daughter of God. Don't be swayed by hardship that comes your way, stand confidently and firmly knowing that you are, that you are his. Amen. Thirdly, fix your eyes on what's to come. Don't be so focused on 2017, but look 10,000 years down the road. What's this going to make in 10,000 years? And then finally, be upheld in the midst of your suffering. You're not going to be 
guarded from it. You're going to be in the midst of suffering. You're going to experience it, but in the middle of it, be upheld by it. Know that you are a son or a daughter of God, and you're going to be held secure. So as you close your eyes and bow your heads this morning, I want us to get real just for a minute if we can. You know, I think that a lot of times we go through the, the motions of what, is, of what is expected of us as, as believers, as children of God, but we lose sight of the fact that we are the children of God. And so we are passive about sin. We, we aren't as concerned about getting in the Word. We're not as concerned about spending time in prayer. We're not as concerned about letting the Spirit of God show us where our sin is because we're passive about it. Don't be passive over your sin. And you forget sometimes that we're, that we're children of God and we walk around so anxious and so afraid. I don't know that there's ever been more of an anxious generation than what we see here and now. I know that we have some among our, our kids, but I think our parents are anxious people. Full of anxiousness. Worrying about what's to come. Worrying about what's happening tomorrow. Worrying about what ha- what's happening in, in two weeks. Worrying about what's happening in two months. As children of God, God is already there. God is in the midst of those moments for us. And we can stand confidently as children, knowing that whatever comes our way, we are, we are His. And then fix your eyes. Have you stopped fixing your eyes on what's to come? When was the last time you thought about the inheritance that you have as a believer? Not just the, the things that we'll be able to be a part of that we can't understand, but being able to be face-to-face with Jesus. When was the last time we thought about that and that drove us to, to make the decisions that we make and act the way that we act? And then remember to be upheld in the midst of your suffering, knowing that you are a child of God, knowing that God is there, knowing that nothing can separate you, knowing that nothing can pull you apart of that, of that, that yoke that you have with, with God through Christ. But all of that is contingent on all of it's contingent on on whether or not the Spirit of God is living within you. So for for a believer, we've got so much hope to know that this is not us for us, that we can live confidently, that we can live knowing that we've got something coming, that we we can be upheld in the midst of suffering. But for the person that does not live in the Spirit, for the person that is not a child of God, that's never placed their faith in Christ, based off of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, it says that you are a child of wrath by nature which means that you are at opposition against God. That you are in this place of rebellion, even though you may not see it. Like That's where you are, no relationship with God whatsoever. And all it takes, we see is in Roman, Romans 10, 9 and 10, we believe in our heart that Christ died for us and that he was raised for our sin. If we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, we shall be saved. Do you want to be an adopted child of God today? then believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. In that instant, you are brought into the family of God and you are given that inheritance. You are brought into the family. You are now a child of God. And that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. It doesn't make any sense to the mind, but that's what happens. And it's all made possible because of the grace through Christ and the gospel. So I ask you this morning, where, where are you? As a believer, do you need to remember that you are a son, a daughter of God? Or for someone that's never believed the gospel and understood Maybe today is the day that the, the Lord is opening your eyes and opening your ears to be able to hear the gospel in a way that you've never heard before. Let today be the day that you respond in faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, for giving us the word of God and Lord, for speaking to us and reminding us that we, are, that we are your sons and daughters, Father. Lord, that should be something that changes every single thing that we do. God, it should change the way that we act. It should change the way that we speak. It should change the way that we go through difficulty. It should change everything about us, Father, simply by being a son or daughter of God. And so, Lord, for those this morning that are not not walking after you as true children, Father, I pray that they would understand that there is so much grace. Uh, There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. So where there needs to be forgiveness and repentance, God, there's grace to make that possible today. And I pray that today would be a day where, Lord, where people would come and just repent of failing to remember that they are your children. For those that are, are lost, that are not your children this morning, I pray that this morning will be a day where 
They come and they say, God, I, I need to be saved. And they would see, they would taste and see, like David says, that your grace is good. They can be brought into your family and enjoy all these benefits, Father. All these benefits are not just the things we're after, Father, but we thank you for you. We want you. And we're grateful that you give us you. So I pray that you would move through this invitation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and turn to page 465? guys for being here this morning. Appreciate your attentiveness today and uh, glad that we were able to spend some time together in the Word. It was a blessing. Um, any announcements before we wrap up this morning? Right on. Good deal. Thank you guys for being here again tonight. Six o'clock. Be here for uh, the Edwards family. It should be a blessing. Bring somebody with you. It'll be an awesome time together. I'm going to ask Jeff Sapret to close us in prayer.